Welcome back to Man's Funny Feminism. I'm Jackson, joined by Ben Zolan and Nikolai. Today we are going to talk about uh, life in Germany after the war, right? And kind of how men and women dealt with the PTSD of war, I guess. So the first thing that I think we're going to kind of discuss is uh, the film, right? And how different characters are portrayed in the uh, the movie. I'm gonna let our viewers know what the movie's title is and what's about. Yes, I got that. So the movie. What? Yeah, you want? I got that. Yeah, I got that. I got that. I got that. I'll give you a little bit of a break. All right. The movie is called The Murderers Are Among Us. Um, and it was the first uh, Trümmer film, which is a rubble film, um, post World War II film, filmed in 1945, uh, released in 1946. So, uh, all the the set is the actual destroyed city of Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, which is cool. Yeah, that's just I, 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 I thought that was pretty interesting how they like actually mm -hmm. filmed and like it wasn't like a like a setup like it was like the actual like burned down rubble buildings. Yeah, and, there were videos left. of like actual buildings falling yeah, down. Yeah. So it's it's um I think it's an interesting movie because while it is like a drama, a dramatic cinematic movie, it's also very much real life. It's a documentary. Yeah, it's also a documentary, which is really. <clears throat> Powerful. Which is it's a really strange combination of, of things, but it's really it's really a, yeah it is a powerful uh, powerful way to film. So in the uh, in the movie uh, we have a male and a female main character, and you kind of see that the difference in how they I guess cope with the trauma that they had from war. Um, the male would drink, and he would keep drinking until he got drunk to deal with his problems, while the female would internalize it. Do you guys think that that's maybe accurate to what it might have been like for the two different groups of people? Well, I think that there are a lot of factors that can go into uh, how how women would have would have reacted to what they had been through in the war. So, I mean, I think a lot of men would have reacted uh, or would have experienced PTSD the same way because most men were veterans and they would have experienced a lot of the same things. Right. Um, the, a lot of women would have experienced some different things. So there's like a, there was a one out of ten chance that when the Soviets invaded uh, Berlin, they were raped, which is obviously a big uh, cause of PTSD if that happens to you. It's very traumatic. Um, but in, in, in the case of the female lead, uh, she was actually she actually spent a lot of time in a concentration camp. So there's obviously that PTSD from that experience uh, we can assume is there. Um, however, it's not really represented in the film, so we. As viewers are kind of just led to, led to believe that she kind of just got over it, or it didn't affect her that much. Right. So I, sorry, uh, I think that maybe the point they're trying to make <coughs> is that um, there's there's experienced very different kinds of violence. Granted, I mean she was she wasn't there when Berlin fell, um, but like being in a camp. I mean, it could be assumed in the film that she wasn't necessarily Jewish because she looked Aryan. So she probably was a it could probably be assumed she was a political prisoner or some other kind of group that was or one of those women that like slept around yeah. from sent to the camps. Yeah, just something that, that you know, pissed off the Nazi party. But I think that um I just totally lost my train of thought. Oh. I think that she, she obviously like not saying that her trauma is worse, but I mean, it's different two different kinds of trauma where it's like he kind of being a doctor was kind of face first with it, just assaulted every day with it. While her was more of like a impending sense of doom, being like a concentration camp. And plus, I mean, think about it like this. Um, she, um, well, she I mean she survived and she seemed to be just kind of like she, like a lot of women after war kind of do this. They kind of like like you who said it, internalizing it. It's just kind of like it's like okay, it happened. I'm gonna try to move on. Whereas the kind of detail of the film, uh, the main character Hans, or one of the main characters, Hans, the doctor, he he can't move on because of what he did in the war, what he was complicit doing. So I think she was more of a victim than he was. He was kind of complacent in the crimes committed by the Nazis. I think that's kind of what weighs on him greater. But I mean, the roles were reversed. We really couldn't tell. I think that the guilt. Feels is definitely an important factor, um, but we can look back at like the last podcast where we were talking about the differences in how like men and women coped um, in the concentration camps. Like mm -hmm. women were very 
much trying to take care of each other and create families to kind of move past all the kind of horror that they had to face while the men were kind of like very focused on surviving and mostly by themselves. Um, or at least dealing with the situation by themselves. And in this situation, like Suzanne in the movie is trying to create like kind of like help Han steal and like she falls in love with him, so she almost kind of creates trying to create another family to cope with that PTSD. Whereas like Hans he does end up like choosing to love <coughs> or like stay with Suzanne create a family but his initial reaction is just like to go into like a spiral of alcoholism and just trying to be on his own and deal with it on his own like in the way he saw that fit saw fit was like through like hunting down Bruckner yeah whereas like his first reaction is like anger and rage which is just I mean yeah I know I understand it very bad you said you know I kind of wanted to touch up on something we briefly mentioned in class the fact that he turned to alcohol and she didn't. So, you know, we kind of talked about this in class already, but when the Allied forces would rescue the people from the concentration camps, they wouldn't, they would want to give them food, but they couldn't, they're like, the people living in the concentration camps, their body couldn't handle all that food because they had been starved for so long. So people were actually dying from eating a whole bunch of food. And that was the, uh, the same case applied for alcohol, right? They hadn't had, their tolerance to alcohol was probably so low and because they were so malnourished they weren't able to drink alcohol without suffering serious consequences yeah. do you think that and this is for any of you guys do you guys think that the fact that they were in a concentration camp and their body couldn't handle the alcohol meant that they wouldn't turn to alcohol or do you think that these people if they had gone through different hardships in war um where they weren't malnourished, they would have also turned like turned to alcohol if they could handle it. I think they probably would have turned to alcohol, and I, I mean, a bunch of them did turn to alcohol and still died. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I think they would have still turned to alcohol. Um, well, I looked up like because I was curious to see like how um, like how women I guess their relationship with alcohol because I didn't know like obviously men. study that says that men are twice as likely uh, as women to use alcohol as a coping strategy. That's mm -hmm. interesting. So, yeah, I didn't know that either. One thing I think we, that everybody needs to keep in mind when watching this movie is that it came out, it's made by Germans, for Germans, only a year after World War II. So, yeah, it's, propaganda. it's, it's, you can almost say that it's a, it's a little bit of propaganda, but not it's what is propaganda for the common person, not for a political party. No. And each and these characters have a specific role that they play. So the woman <clears throat> plays this this redeeming role because because the the majority of the Germans are supposed to relate with uh, with with Hans, the doctor, um, who was a soldier, like the majority of German men, but he is disgusted with the the actions that the Nazis. Did, and he wants revenge. So that, that provides this beacon that, that, that German soldiers can, can kind of go to and say, like, this this is me. I, I, I relate with Dr. Hans. I don't like what happened. Um, and then there's there's this, uh, I mean, the, the woman comes from the concentration camp, and her job is to redeem. Her, her role in the film is to redeem the doctor, um, is to kind of bring him back from, this, from that edge. And so the movie is centered around the forgiveness and then... Uh, court justice, not vigilantism. I mean, I think it's just important that it is a bit of propaganda. It's made for Germans by Germans. Do you all think that people like Hans? Because I'm, I mean, I'm sure that when he says that Bruckner ordered the killing of a hundred Polish men and women, I mean, I assume that Hans was one of the people that had to carry out the action. Yeah, yeah I mean, he I was a. People deserved forgiveness. I mean, if um. I mean, the killing of, like, 100 people was so common on the Eastern Front that, like, yeah. I mean, 
maybe not. I mean, I don't think you can forgive that necessarily, but you, I mean, you, I mean, I don't think you can forgive it, but you have to take into consideration the time and not the time, but also the just absolute chaos fever that was gripping the nation. Right. Here's the other thing. Like, I mean, granted, if even if you like resisted orders and was like, I'm not doing this, you would have gotten shot and killed and right. he would have done it anyway. He would have died anyways and they would have still carried out the the action. So I mean, while it's not right what he did, I think he redeems himself. I feel like when you put in a situation like that, I think staying alive, I think this is my if I was in his shoes, I think staying alive long enough to redeem yourself is better than just dying for no reason. I I agree with that, but I, I would say I don't think it's about deserving forgiveness. Um, especially during that time, it was just like, like you got to pick up somewhere. And I'm sure that pretty much everybody in that situation did horrible, some sort of horrible thing yeah. to get by. Um, and the, I mean, and if you, there wasn't like, like some sort of understanding, then like, I mean, like the entire country of Germany would be would need to be punished because to to some degree everyone unless they were one of the few people that was like that were like actively smuggling and trying to save Jews is responsible for right. the atrocities. Yeah, at least some level of yeah. yeah yeah. I mean yeah. That's I think that's a an interesting point that Ben you made is that do you think that people like Hans that were disgusted at the actions of the Nazis, but I mean, they were you know following the orders of the complicit. Nazis or complicit. They they realized that no matter what I do, they're still going to go through with this. So I might as well try and save myself, even if you know that means I have to participate in this unstoppable thing that's going to happen. This horrible thing like killing a hundred. Polish people. I don't know. I, I think that's a, probably something that a lot of soldiers had to think about because, I mean, humans know the difference between right and wrong. And I think that a lot of the, the Nazis that were complicit, they were just trying to keep themselves alive, right? And, and so they probably realized that you know, no, no matter what I do, these people are still going to die. So I, 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 like, I just have to stick it out for as long as I can and do the bare minimum of terrible things. So do we think that's forgivable or understandable or just complete like just completely depressed? I think I mean, you have to like you have to put it you have to put yourself in their shoes. And psychologically every like on every study shows that if you're in that position you are going to Dude, like, right. like you are not special. You're not going to be the one that stand up and say like this is not right. You're probably going to do it. It's either you watch. Just, it's, it's either kill, kill or be killed. Yeah, because yeah. Like, just I feel like killed. that that's more that's bigger than like gender. I feel like that's a way with women and men are both similar. Is the kind of the idea of wanting to survive, you know, which is kind of interesting because kind of going back, I just realized it. The concentration camp kind of going back there. Um, because like I feel like a big part of like that and not sticking to like the depression in those camps was the, the thought of like okay how am I gonna stay alive like that there's like a good name for it, that feeling you have like of like this is how I'm gonna stay alive this is how we're gonna you know keep moving forward and I think it's interesting that the men and women chose different ways and the men kind of like they can like kind of internalize that feeling like okay I am gonna stay alive for then I feel like the women we're kind of like, we're gonna stay alive for other women we're gonna stay alive for each other yeah I read this book when I was a senior in high school that it's like an autobiography basically where they follow the the life of this this kid this Italian kid and he he was being transported by the Nazis and he said that on one of his transports they were in this huge like it was him and a whole bunch of other Jewish people that were in this like train or whatever that they were transporting in they had some food on the, or in their little like carriage or whatever, and people were so desperate, like Jews that knew each other were so desperate to like stay alive that like two people would like start going at it over a piece of food and like one person would 
literally strangle and kill another person right in front of everyone else in the car and everyone else in the car would just like, they just sit and watch because it's like, you know, they're, they're, everyone's fighting to stay alive and it's, it's understandable. Yeah. It's also like, I read a book called Night by, um, uh, I can't remember the guy's last name, but his first name is Eli and he's a Lizel. Lizel? Lizel. You're right. Um, and he was a, a Holocaust survivor. He went through it when he was like, as a young teen. It was his dad, he went through Auschwitz. Um, and he was, one of the parts of the book that stuck out to me was that the Nazis had, they would just pick men, strong men, Jewish men, from who came in, and then they would give them the job of hurting the other Jewish people into the camp, and they would, and those Jewish men would like jeer and, and like taunt and like tell them like, you're going to die, like your family's going to die, and they're Jewish themselves. This right. is not, this is not, this is not like crapping on Jewish people, obviously, but it's just saying, people put in this scenario, like they have to stay horrific alive. Horrific scenarios yeah. act yeah. certain ways. Um, I think that's human nature. Do you think that, you know, obviously this, we're, we're talking strictly about men here. Do you think if women were put in the same situation, like if they were put in these concentration camps, I, I do. And they had to kill these people, do you think they'd act similar or different? I do, I think there's, a picture. there was this one instance in Iraq, or I don't know if it was Iraq, so I might be the wrong country. In the Middle East, Abu Ghraib uh, prison, this is US soldiers, there was a prison that was pretty much like it, the government wasn't watching how the American soldiers were running it. Um, and I think the CIA was involved, believe it or not. But they were, uh, they, they had a bunch of Islamic prisoners and they were men. And they would, uh, they were basically psychologically torturing them. They'd like make them perform fake sexual acts on each other. Um, and like they'd like make, they'd like strip them naked and they'd make them like stack themselves into like a naked human pyramid. And two of the guards were females. And they like took smiling pictures with these like poor prisoners of war who are being completely violated on every on every level. Dehumanized. Like Stanford, Stanford prison experiment. Yeah, the Stanford prison experiment is a, is a, we also talked about that. It's good. Um, do you want to ask? I'm pretty sure females were involved in the experiment. So I'll ask. I think it was only guys because the the dude who was running it, his girlfriend told him that if he didn't shut it down, she was gonna break up with him after she saw it because. They split the two groups of they split the guys into two groups, and it was in the basement of a, like a building at Stanford. Yeah. And they simulated a mock prison. Half the people were guards, half the people were prisoners. And they I've heard said you this. can't beat them. But like within two days, they had pretty much like like devolved into chaos. The guards had banded together against the prisoners and were like like spraying them with water, making them strip, like forcing them into solitary confinement, and they didn't realize really what was, they didn't realize how crazy they had become in only a week. Even the, the guy who was running the experiment didn't really realize how wild it was until his girlfriend came in from the outside and, and was appalled. So I think that slipping into these power dynamics is very easy. For both, I men, and both men and women. I mean, but I would also argue that they guess for good, because that took place in the 70s, I guess modern day are probably different, but at the time, I feel like that would be. I mean, if, I don't are, think if humans are threatened with their life, it's only gonna 50. Happen. I mean, I don't want to be like, I'm going to have a Joe Rogan moment right here. We're looking at like, we have been the same type of person for 300,000 years. 50 years of existence from like 1970 to now is yeah, not going to change. You always say men are like kind of like predisposed to kind of taking power or trying. I think they're pre predisposed to violence. I mean, like, also, also, you have to take into mind like the consideration of like, like men's young men's mental state from age like eighteen to twenty five is there's no fear of death. They're, they're incredibly impressionable. There's a reason the U.S. draft goes from eighteen to twenty five is because in that time frame, young men are perfect impressionable killing machines, and they'll do and take whatever you tell them to do as normal as long as you put them through the process. I mean, every country knows it. That's interesting. Guys, the difference between that and what. Uh... So, would you say that, like, you know, I think, I think two genders then, and that, like, in a certain situation like that, or other than life or death, they, that they, um, they balance each other out. I think that women, uh, and then, I mean, granted, there's, like, different you know, exceptions, but I feel like, like, a life or death situation or something like that, I feel like women and men could balance each other out. Do you mean, like, one would be be harmless and one would do the harming? No, or? no, not necessarily. I'm saying that, like, um, like, I guess men are kind of, if you were arguing that a little bit more predisposed to violence, 
more than women. And there's kind of that dynamic where women are less, they can kind of temper the man, but then the man can also kind of like, you see, you see what I'm saying? That might be a little bit out of pocket, yeah. but like, I'm just saying that like, I feel like you can't, like the two genders, I mean, cause we're all it's kind of the same, they're kind of inseparable. You can't really separate men and women because in all male scenario, like things could go wrong and all women's scenario could go wrong. I feel like, and that may also be just the people from different, you know, levels of society, different, you know, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I think you also need people that are totally separate from the violence. True. Which, to, to kind of keep those things in line. That, to, so they have an outside perspective saying this is not right. Yeah. The, Nazi, the thing with the Nazis though is that the people at the highest part of, of the government that wouldn't be in the violence were the ones encouraging the violence. Interesting. Which just... Well, um, there's... I don't want to keep talking about but all these different experiments but I'll just like say it real quick. Well, there's a study done that's saying that like humans, when they have the opportunity to shift the blame, they will. And like, when something is felt like it's a decision made by a group, then people can say, well, it's not my fault. They, this other person also like supported. In this situation, it's not my fault that this violence happened because other people were the just. I was just following right. orders. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what a lot of Nazis said. That's the thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, do you have anything else? Here? That that's all I have. I, I just wanted to actually, hammer that point about yeah, me differences or like, kind of like the difference and just kind of like I feel like I'm moving forward in our society, and then this is really great. Move back to kind of how feminism. I think the, the fight for feminism should work. You need you can't you need both genders for I feel like anything. You need both men and women to work together to solve issues, and I feel like. I think that's the great thing about feminism is that it can't just be done by women. You need, like, it's like yin and, yin and the yang. You need men to help with feminism, just as you need women to help, you know, balance men out. It's all about balance, and I feel like that's kind of like kind of the point we're all kind of like, kind of, you know, talking yeah, about it. Around. Yeah, I think I guess it basically all moves back to the idea that feminism is both uh, both genders is their fight, not not just the women's fight. On that note, tune in later. Yep. As always, uh, this is Mansplaining Feminism. You guys have a good rest of your day.